Hello, so this is video number one of section 5.3. Uh, so in uh, this section, we're going to talk about diagonalization, um, which I will define in a second. First, I wanna quickly go over a, a note and um, sort of a few examples of, uh, well, some things we've seen so far and kind of contextualizing this note. And these examples will then help us as we move forward talking about diagonalization. So. Um, first things first, this may have been mentioned at some point or another um, previously. It may also have been mentioned in your book, and I just failed to formally state it in the notes. Uh, so I wanted to quickly formally state it now, that any n by n matrix can have at most n distinct eigenvalues and at most n linearly independent eigenvectors. So a quick explanation as to why that's the case. Um, so remember, if I have a matrix right, that has, well, every distinct eigenvalue corresponding to a matrix must have at least one eigenvector that's associated with it, right? So like any eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. Um, we've seen examples, I think, where you know, one eigenvalue could have maybe multiple eigenvectors, but um, each eigenvalue has at least one. And remember in section 5.1, we showed that um, two eigenvectors corresponding to two distinct eigenvalues always have to be linearly independent, no matter what. So if each eigenvector is of length n, and I had more than n plus one linearly independent eigenvectors, well, that would contradict everything we've learned about Rn and bases thus far, right? That I can't have more than n linearly independent vectors of length n. Um, and so for that reason, any matrix A can have at most n linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, and so that actually then also implies the eigenvalue part of this statement, that if you look at, um, remember each distinct eigenvalue, Remember, that eigenvalue has to be associated with one linearly independent distinct eigenvector. And so if you had, say, more than n distinct eigenvalues, let's say you had n plus 1 distinct eigenvalues, certainly then you would have n plus 1 linearly independent eigenvectors, and that's also not possible. Um, so for that reason, you can have at most n distinct eigenvalues and at most n linearly independent eigenvectors. So keep that in mind moving forward. So. I want to look at three examples of kind of different eigenvalue eigenvector combinations we might see when looking at n by n matrices. Um, as it turns out, two by two matrices give us a wide enough range of examples that we can kind of, um, you know, we have enough to, to discuss just looking at two by two matrices. So first things first, this matrix A has two distinct eigenvalues. Well, and because each of these eigenvalues is distinct, each one should have at least one linearly independent eigenvector that's associated with it. But at that point, this matrix can have at most two distinct eigenvalues, which it has, and two linearly independent eigenvectors, one associated with each eigenvalue, which it has. So this is a type of matrix which, in a sense, has the maximum amount of eigenvalues. And because all of those eigenvalues are distinct, we actually know that it has to have exactly two linearly independent eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues. Um, so I don't want to say that this type of matrix is boring, but there's not as much to look at if we know that the matrix has n distinct eigenvalues, or in this case, two. Um, and you know, certainly I've, I, I've calculated the eigenvalues here and eigenvectors here for all of these matrices. Um, I'd highly encourage you to, to go through the process of calculating all of these for all of these matrices. Um, you know, it'll be great practice, certainly. So anyways, B and C represent cases which are a little more interesting because each of these only has one distinct eigenvalue. And with one distinct eigenvalue, especially with the two by two matrix, we have a little bit more or a few more possibilities for what can happen. Um, and so that's the case you know, in all your general any dimension, right, for any values of n, that if you have less than n distinct eigenvalues, as we'll see, um, there's a little bit more that can happen when looking at eigenvectors. 
So notice B here is an upper triangular matrix um, with one distinct eigenvalue 2, because 2 is the only value on its diagonal. And we've already learned that an upper triangular matrix, all of its eigenvalues have to fall on its diagonal. Um, so lambda is equal to 2. And it can be shown, again, using the standard process um, of calculating eigenvectors, that this eigenvalue actually only has one linearly independent eigenvector, V1. And so, again, note, that is not to say that, like, so as an example of what I'm saying, that's not to say that 1, 0 is the only eigenvector, right? This eigenvector, for example, 3, 0 is also an eigenvector. What is this saying is that every other eigenvector of this matrix corresponding to 2 is a scalar multiple of 1, 0. Right? So notice these two vectors are not linearly independent, even though they're both eigenvectors. But C also has one eigenvalue equal to 2. But notice, because of the structure of C, C actually has two linearly independent eigenvalues, 1, 0, and 0, 1, or eigenvectors, sorry. And so notice here, the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to 2 is equal to 2. Whereas here, the dimension of the eigenspace corresponding to 2 is equal to 1. So even if we don't have n distinct eigenvalues, it's possible we could have n distinct eigenvectors. Um, but it's also possible that we might not. So these three, you know, you can have n distinct eigenvalues, in which case you always have n distinct eigenvectors. You could have potentially less than n eigenvalues, which means, again, you could have um, you know, a varying number of linearly independent eigenvectors. Keep these examples in mind as we move forward, um, because this will have a lot to do with uh, sort of what we talk about when we talk about diagonalization. So we should define our main definition of the video. An n by n matrix A. is diagonalizable if it is similar to a diagonal matrix D. And so remember, this means that A is equal to P times D times p inverse, um, where p is an invertible matrix. And we'll actually see that we know a lot about p, and we kind of care about p in this case. Um, but in some sense, you know, showing similarity, p isn't the important matrix per se. Um, it's just an invertible matrix, which can, I guess, sort of perform the similarity transformation. All right. so. We want to look at diagonal, diagonalizable matrices. I guess it's important now to answer the question of when is a matrix diagonalizable? Turns out we know exactly when a matrix is diagonalizable. As is stated in theorem 5, so an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. All right, so that's nice. We know exactly when it's diagonalizable, right? We just have to calculate its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But we actually know more. We actually know what the diagonal matrix is going to look like, and we know what the matrix P is going to look like. So not only do we know when it's diagonalizable, we actually know how to diagonalize it. And so in fact, 
Well, A is equal to P times D times P inverse. So this is the, I guess, equation way of stating that a matrix is diagonalizable um, with D being diagonal. If and only if the columns of P are the n independent eigenvectors of A. So, and then in this case, D contains the eigenvalues of A on its diagonal and the order of these diagonal entries corresponds to the order of the vectors in P. Or I guess I should say columns of P. All right, so that was a mouthful. Um, let's discuss this. So we know when a matrix is diagonalizable if and only if it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So if you go back to our first example, you could actually determine which of those matrices A, B, and C are diagonalizable just by looking at uh, the eigenvectors. But we know a little more. So we know that we've got this similarity transformation with D being diagonal, if and only if the columns of P are the n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the columns of, well, exactly what it means, right, is that the matrix P that is sort of um, diagonalizing A in this sense, right, or performing this similarity transformation is just the matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors of A. So you can find this matrix P very easily once you've determined if A is diagonalizable. On top of that, D is the diagonal matrix whose entries in order are the eigenvalues of A corresponding to the ordered columns of P. So if a matrix is diagonalizable, we know very much what D looks like and what P looks like. So this theorem is extremely powerful because it tells us two things. It tells us when is a matrix diagonalizable and if it is diagonalizable, how to find P and D. It also sort of lets us go backwards, um, that if we know that a matrix is similar to a diagonal matrix D, well, we know the eigenvalues and we know a lot about its eigenvectors. So having this sort of property of being similar to a diagonal matrix is just so powerful because of, again, sort of this property of, um, being similar to, you know, because of like how much we can learn by knowing that this matrix is similar to a diagonal matrix. So I want to look at um, a couple examples and then we'll end by proving this theorem. So uh, there's actually a slightly more thorough example on your worksheet, um, which for time I won't really be able to go over here. Um, it's not very crucial to the um, course as a whole, uh, but it's really interesting because it gives you sort of another application as to um, why diagonalization is important. Um, so I'd highly recommend looking at it. It's the second page of the diagonalization part of the worksheet, and it sort of walks you through some steps on, um, you know, relating a matrix to its diagonal, ma diagonal matrix that it's similar to. Uh, but so example one, 
So we actually know that the matrix B, which we saw previously, is not diagonalizable. Because it has one linearly independent eigenvector. Example two, however, we're going to go back and look at the matrix A. is diagonalizable. Um, because remember, A had two linearly independent eigenvectors, V1 equals 1, negative 1, and 1, negative 2. corresponding to, well, lambda 1 equals 5, and lambda 2 is equal to 3, where v1 corresponds to lambda 1 and v2 corresponds to lambda 2. So we know that a is equal to p times d times p inverse, where P is the matrix whose columns are the ordered eigenvectors of A. So 1, negative 1 and 1, negative 2. And D is the matrix whose a diagonal matrix and whose ordered diagonal entries correspond to the same indexed column of P. And we don't really, um, we could quickly calculate P inverse. P inverse isn't really the important thing here. Um, because, um, right, we know it's invertible, we know it exists, and by the theorem, we actually already know that this relation holds, so we don't really even need to verify it. Um, what's more important is the columns of P are the ordered eigenvectors of A, and that the entries of D are the ordered eigenvalues of A, where here the first eigenvalue corresponds to P, and the second eigenvalue corresponds, or First eigenvalue corresponds to the first column of P, and the second eigenvalue corresponds to the second column of P. So we know when a matrix is diagonalizable. Um, like I said, I just want to finish up proving this theorem. Uh, it's a relatively short proof, um, and I've got it sort of outlined on the worksheet, so I'd highly recommend looking at that before watching this. Um, like I said, I've got a few more problems on the worksheet corresponding to this um, example here. Um, that are, you know, sort of interesting in their own right and give some nice insight and another look at why diagonalization is uh, useful. Uh, and so I'd highly recommend looking at that. I'll have the answers posted and all of that as well, and I'm happy to talk about it, but just for the sake of time, um, there's certainly a lot to talk about this section. Um, I'm going to leave that as an exercise. All right, proof of theorem five. So I want to show that the matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, I'm going to do so, again, since it's an if and only if, I'm going to start by assuming it has n linearly independent eigenvectors, and then basically finding a diagonalization, and then I'm going to go the other way. So first things first, we're going to assume that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And I'll just call them V1 through Vn. So um, 
And we'll suppose that each of these eigenvectors, the ordered eigenvectors, correspond to the ordered eigenvalues. So we'll say corresponding to eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda n, where, again, v1 corresponds to lambda 1, v2 corresponds to lambda 2, and so on. So we're going to let p be the matrix we think it should be, whose columns are defined by these eigenvectors, right? Then just sort of note p inverse exists. The reason this statement is true is because, again, we know that these columns are linearly independent. And so the invertible matrix theorem tells us that, again, if I have this matrix with linearly independent columns, then you know we get this nice invertible uh, property, again, out of the invertible matrix theorem. So we want to show that, in fact, A times P is equal to P times D. And notice this is equivalent to showing that A is diagonalizable, where D is the diagonal matrix that looks like this, right? whose diagonal entries are lambda 1 through lambda n and has zeros everywhere else. And notice this is actually equivalent to showing that a is equal to p times d times p inverse because p is invertible. And so I can just multiply both sides of this equation by p inverse to get this. Well, this just amounts to sort of applying the definition of matrix multiplication. a times p is equal to a times v1, a times v2, a times vn. I've sort of distributed A through the columns of P in this way. Well, and since each of these are eigenvectors corresponding to the ordered eigenvalues, I can rewrite this in this way. Well, and then this is just equal to P times D, right? Because I can factor out D in this sense, be left with P times the matrix D. And so, I've got this relation, which implies this relation, which I've got one part of the proof shown. And what's kind of interesting is the other part of the proof basically just works backwards from here. So um, I'll, it's described in a little more detail in the worksheet, but basically what happens is to show the other way, right? So I'll at least write out the first step of part two of this. We assume that A is diagonalizable and we show that this implies that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And so basically what you do is, well, this shows that A is diagonalizable, right? This is like the beginning assumption that A is diagonalizable. Well, and then what you do is you just sort of start here, factor everything out to show that, in fact, that entries of this matrix P that are diagonalizing A have to be the eigenvalues or eigenvectors um, of A because you end up getting the same relation again that A times V1 is equal to lambda 1 V1 and so on. Um, and so, interestingly, this is one of those, again, theorems that, like, you, you read and you're like, no way. And then you look at the proof, it's like, oh, you know, you just kind of work it out and it works out that way. But so anyways, that's diagonalization. Um, we're going to look at a few more examples moving forward and then a few more nice properties that we know about diagonalizable matrix matrices. Uh, but yeah, that wraps up the first video.